Hello and welcome to Tank and Affy News. My name's Tom and it's a book review. So uh, a couple weeks ago in the mail we got our copy of the new Osprey Duel title, Panzerfaust vs. Sherman, European Theater, 1944 through 1945. This one is of course by Stephen J. Zaloga, a name that should be familiar to most people watching this channel. If you follow World War II tanks at all, he's pretty much written more than just about anyone else and he's written a lot of these dual series books. In fact, this one's kind of, um, sort of a, I won't call it a companion, but kind of a counterpoint to a book he did um, the previous year, which was Bazooka vs. Panzer Battle of the Bulge 1944. So he looked at the Bazooka vs. German tanks, and then this next one's looking at Panzerfaust. And, and the title's a little deceiving. It's also looking at Panzer Shrek. It's like pretty much any of the German um, uh, hollow charge warhead launching devices that they had developed um, in the latter half of World War II. Uh, and this one, if you're familiar with the Duel series, it, it's a very tried and true format at this point. Um, it's, oh, what, about 90 pages long? Yep, 90 pages. Um, as with all Osprey titles, uh, you know, it's a soft cover, well put together, combination of uh, text, oh, lots of black and white, primarily black and white photos, because obviously if it's a World War II topic, it's going to be mostly black and white, but some color prints and illustrations. So here's a good example of sort of what you expect. So you got some black and white photos here, some text, then you got some nice, uh, whoops, yeah, on this side, camera reverses things. Um, uh, illustration of, you get a, an, an easy 8 there, well, an M4A3 E8 to be precise. Uh, recently on the internet, people have been getting trouble if, if they mean M4A3 E8 and they just say Easy 8 instead, because technically the Easy 8 just refers to the suspension, not to the rest of the tank. Uh, if you follow any uh, of the AFV, World War II AFV Facebook groups, you might understand what I'm talking about. Anyway, back to the book. Um, so it's sort of uh, divided the usual way these dual books are. They sort of go through design and development, technical specs, then sort of the combatants, strategic situation, combat analysis, aftermath, and further reading. Um, his general, so, so lots of good descriptions of these um, handheld German devices, as well as some of the Allied tankers' um, efforts to counteract them. So a um, little more detailed than some of the other books Salog has done, um, talking about some of like the, the sandbag, the concrete armor, some of the steel armor, uh, you know, particular Third Army put on some of their tanks to kind of protect against these weapons. He gets into some of the, the figures and statistics on, um, you know, how effective these weapons were in terms of, of uh, Allied tank casualties, which percentage was caused by these uh, hollow charge projection devices. And um, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's, it's sort of situational. It depends on um, uh, what part of the, the, the campaign we're talking about and what other weapons the Germans have on hand. So sort of as, as, as the Easter, or as the, uh, the 1944, 1945, as, as time goes on, you see Allied tank losses, these weapons becoming a higher percentage just because we're seeing less of the other larger, more expensive German anti-tank weapons are available and on the battlefield. So those sort of things get more desperate. This becomes more and more the predominant form of anti-tank defense. Uh, although the percentages are still, it's, it's, you know, we're not talking like half. It's, it's still like less than that, even at its highest point. And like I said, it just depends on the, the balance of forces involved. Um, and, you know, they were effective weapons. Uh, they certainly had their limitations, especially the Panzerfaust, which was the one that was made in such large numbers. And he goes through the different designs and models. Um, you know, but the very short-ranged weapon, you know, uh, uh, not a terribly accurate one. Um, certainly um, not a weapon for... Um, uh, somebody without a good amount of courage and determination because it involves getting really close to an allied tank uh, and then hoping that you're, you know, aiming the thing correctly. But if it does hit and the fuse goes off, because that's the other big issue is, is, is the fuse reliability, um, if it does go off, you know, these things have really quite impressive penetration stats, um, all things considered. And, you know, certainly you can see, um, you know, it's sort of a harbinger of things to come in the post-war period where... Uh, you know, particularly the Soviet RPG-7 uh, would become such a ubiquitous threat to armored vehicles because it's small, compact, and can punch its way through, you know, really amazing amount of steel plate compared to, you know, when you look at World War II gun stat penetration stats, and then you look at what some of these, you know, little rinky-dink shoulder-launched 
hollow charge warhead weapons can do, and it's 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 almost shocking, you know, so the effectiveness of those. So you can certainly see why in the post-war world people started to think that armor armor plate was obsolete um, to a certain extent. So you know, by the by the second generation of post World War II tanks, you have things like Leopard One and AMX Thirty, where they're like, just make it proof against against small caliber stuff because there's no point trying to armor against these anti-tank weapon systems. Just try to make the tank fast so it's harder to hit. Um, and of course that would all change by the third generation um, when, when, when we're moving beyond just steel plate and into uh, you know Shobum armor and all those kind of things where they can actually defeat these kind of warheads. But anyway, that's far off topic. If you're interested in this topic of Panzerfaust and also the, the topic of you know, what U.S. tankers were doing to their tanks as far as add-on armor. Um, this is going to be a very handy read, or a handy book, and an interesting read, and I recommend it. Like, pretty much, I mean, I don't know if, I don't, I don't think I've ever given his local book a thumbs down. It's, he's um, in, incredibly consistent in terms of uh, the quality of, 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 of the material that he writes and the frequency with which it is produced. So uh, these retail, I think, for about 20 bucks. You can get them a little less on Amazon. Usually just, you know, they usually sell for a little under the, 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 the pr list price. Although I'm sure your local hobby shop would appreciate it if you went in there and bought it from them directly instead. So support your local, support your local um, stores and vendors. So that's all I've got to say on Panzerfaust versus Sherman. Like I said, it makes a nice counterpoint to Bazooka versus Panzer. So with these two, you've got the infantry, uh, infantry sort of shoulder-launched weapons versus tanks on both sides covered. All right, well, thank you, and we will catch you on the next one.